We are in Romans chapter 10. As you remember, in Romans 9, the conclusion was that the Gentiles, because they sought God by faith and not by the works of the law, in other words, they sought to be justified through God's program of grace and faith and not because of their religious activities. They all had to obey the law. They all had to come under God's righteousness. Not the ceremonial law, but the moral law. The Gentiles had to come under that. Uh, as we saw in Romans 8, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, he's continuing on, as we said before, with the problem of uh, the Jews here. Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That should be enough for any Calvinist to say, oh, we're not dealing with predestination right. and unconditional election. He's still praying for them to be saved. Not because he was a weak-minded Jew who cared for Jews, but because he was an apostle. He was an apostle who understood and knew God's method and ways, and he understood and knew that Israel could still be saved. They were elected to damnation. They were predestined to this, but it was because of their own uh, pride and presumption that they got in this situation. So he understood that, and so he's still praying that they might be saved. Later on we find that he's trying to uh, provoke them to jealousy. God is actually trying to provoke them to jealousy. And Paul says that he's magnifying his office in 11, 13, and 14. If by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, it might save some of them. We're dealing with people with free will. You don't try to provoke someone to jealousy to get them to change their mind if, unless they have free will. God has a puppet strings. All he does is just pull the string and get what he wants. So there's no Calvinism in any of this. And I really am uh, surprised at people who call themselves intelligent and educated who get Calvinism out of these chapters. It's Amen. ridiculous. He says here, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. In other words, not according to proper understanding of God's ways. So is that okay? How many people around us have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge? And we want to believe that, well, you know, we believe, we want to think that I hope they're going to be saved. But in this situation, they had a zeal of God, and He's still praying that they might be saved. Their zeal was not according to the knowledge of God's ways. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Which really should be read, for they, being ignorant of God's justification and going about to establish their own justification, have not submitted themselves unto the justification of God, the salvation program of God. Like Cain, Cain probably started out uh, in ignorance of the importance of God's ways. He was assuming that God would be pleased. He came to God. He had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Okay? And he came to God with his fruits and vegetables, the product of the ground, and offering unto the Lord. The fact that his countenance fell means that he probably thought God was going to be pleased. He expected God to be pleased. He expected God to say, well done. And when God said, no, you didn't do what I said, his countenance fell. The problem is he couldn't take correction. There's a difference, there's a big difference in wanting God to be pleased and wanting to please God. Right. There's a difference there. There's a lot of young people or children who want their parents to be pleased and are upset when their parents are not pleased. But the problem was they really weren't trying to please their parents. Right. Okay? There's a difference between trying to please your parents and wanting your parents to be pleased. Cain had that problem. He wanted God to be pleased. But he wasn't really trying to please God. Because he wasn't focused on what God told him to do. Okay? When you're trying to please God, you focus on what God said, how He said to do it, and you do it. When you just want God to be pleased, you do what you think He ought to be pleased with, and then you expect Him to be pleased. That isn't going to work. Okay? And we need to understand the difference there. Amen. It's often the conflict 
in a lot of relationships. Chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for justification to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end. The word means the purpose, the goal, the aim, the target, the fulfillment. The word end means that every part of the law pointed to God's justification program of which Christ was the cornerstone. God killed an innocent animal to clothe Adam and Eve. That was pointing to Christ. Abel brought a lamb as he was commanded. That was pointing to Christ. When Abraham was taking Isaac upon the mountain, in Genesis 22, 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? He had been raised doing this. He knew what the proper method. He, you know, when Abraham told the servant, You stay here, we go yonder to what? Worship and come again. That was the, that was the way it was done. And so that pointed to Christ. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. That was very prophetic. Yeah. We find the Passover lamb in Egypt. The, the death angel was going to come through Egypt and destroy every firstborn in every home unless they had the blood of a lamb slain and put on the doorpost just the way God said. So there it pointed to Christ. All the offerings of Moses' law, all the blood shed in Moses' law, and the washings and the cleansings all pointed to Christ and His priesthood and the work He would do. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So the law taught that principle all the way through the 1500 years that it was incumbent upon the people of Israel. Verse 5 For Moses describeth the justification which is of the law, and I'll insert alone, which is of the law alone, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. In other words, the law apart from grace, the law apart from Christ's atonement, the law all by itself, the only way it can justify is if you perfectly obeyed it without a trespass. What the law cannot deal with is life after trespass. That's what it cannot do. Right. It cannot give life after trespass. All it can do is give condemnation after trespass. Here, three ways uh, to be justified in, the, in the, what we're dealing with. We're talking about justified by the law. Okay, in order to do that, you must be perfectly sinless. Anybody ever fill that role? Well, Jesus did. He was perfectly sinless. He didn't need any justification. Therefore, he could be the justifier. Right. Okay? So that, that's out of the question, but that's what justified by the law means. Justified by grace means you, you, you've already trespassed. Okay? Once you've trespassed, it's either by grace or not at all. That's right. One trespass eliminates justified by the law. All right? So this is justified by grace. Now, this is also the election of grace. In other words, the, the, the people that God chose by His own discretion, by His grace, these are the people in His mercy. Here's where the Jew was trying to establish his own justification. Because he was a son of Abraham, he was doing religious activities, he thought that was good enough, he was doing the Cain thing right here, God said no. Uh -uh. If you're going to be justified by Moses' law apart from Jesus, you've got to be up here. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. So you, you need Jesus. Well, they didn't want Jesus. They crucified Jesus. So, uh, now Moses describeth the justification that the law can give by itself. Okay, that's what he's saying. That the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Leviticus 18.5, he said, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. He's, he's quoting what he said there. That's Moses describing the justification the law can give. That means if you never trespass, then you'll be okay. Galatians 3.12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. He's quoting that passage. Galatians 3.21 Is the law then against the promises of God? Is the law a contrary to God's justification by faith? God forbid. If there had been a law which could have given life after trespass, verily justification should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Nobody made it up here. Okay? And Adam's transgression comes into play there. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 
The only justification the law can offer is forensic justification. And being that we are even condemned in Adam, okay, that is even out of the question. But strictly looking at the law, apart from that, the law could not give life after trespass. Verse 6. But the justification which is of faith, which we've been... Okay, you need to define that according to all that's been said previously. Speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, the word of justification by faith, which we preach. Okay, now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll find that the Apostle Paul is taking a passage from the Old Testament and adapting it to his usage in the New Testament because he's dealing with the same principle. He's dealing with two concepts. Justification by the law alone apart from God's program of grace and sanctification through the blood of Christ or justification by God's program of grace. Knowing that man has fallen, he cannot be justified by the law. So he, in uh, verse 5, he says, The only justification the law can give is if you haven't trespassed. But the justification of faith can be effective after you trespass. Now, that's what Deuteronomy 31-19 through 19 is dealing with, and Paul is adapting that. Let's read it. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. In other words, after trespass. After you've blown it, after you've been scattered away from even the land of Israel. And shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey His voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord, and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments, his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Now, Someone might read that and say, now hold it. There's no way in this foreign land that I can return and do all these things before the Lord brings me back because a lot of these things have a specific place. There's, I mean, most of the sacrifice has to be done in the temple. And there's no priesthood. I'm, I'm driven into a foreign land. There's no priesthood. There's no temple. And how can I do all these things? I may not even have the book of the law. I may not even know all these things. So how can I do that? And what has been said here, it seems like an impossibility. So Moses is going to clarify, okay, that we're not talking about forensic justification. We're not talking even about perfectly obeying the law in this situation. Okay? We're not even talking about after you trespass, get, getting back to perfect performance and not missing a jot or tittle. Okay, so he says here, for this commandment which I commanded this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who should go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? See? It's like, how, how are we going to do what you just said when we don't even have the book of the law or the priesthood or the te temple? How are we going to perfectly perform all this and please the Lord? He says here, but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Mm -hmm. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. 
In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, and his statutes and his judgments, thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day, you shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou passest over Jordan to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that thou, both thou and thy seed may live. Now, obviously the point that he made, that Paul has adapted here, was the portion where it said, if we're carried away, captive, we've already trespassed, we've already blown it, we don't even have the means to do everything you're commanding us this day. How is that going to work? And he said, don't, don't let that stop you. The word is nigh you in your heart and in your mouth. You do what you can do. You turn to God as much as you can turn to God and then go from there. Okay? And that's the word of faith, the justification by faith, the principle of salvation by faith that Paul is adapting here. Let's read it again. But the justification which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Okay, he's quoted Moses in two different places. The first place was about the fact that he that doeth these things shall live in them. Okay? But he says, but the principle of salvation by faith is in this portion, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Because right now, the salvation program is obeying Christ. There it was obeying Moses' law. It's the same principle, same program, but we have a different application of the same principle. That is to bring Christ... If, how can I perfectly obey Christ when He's up in heaven? I don't even know all that He wants. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? What, what is the principle? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, he says, the word of faith which we preach. The principle of salvation by faith. Life after trespass. Life after you've blown it. Life when you don't know everything. You don't have perfect ability or perfect knowledge. How am I going to please God? It's the principle of justification by faith as opposed, as opposed to forensic justification. Okay? So he says here, he adapts it to the New Testament. Now notice, uh, you were, the, the Israelites were still required to obey the law they could obey. So the principle of faith is not uh, excluding the principle of obedience. It's not a matter of the necessity of obedience versus the non-necessity of obedience. It's a matter of obeying everything perfectly or obeying what I know. Right. That's what we're dealing with. Okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. The word of faith which we preach, he's saying here, is the justification by faith. It's not new. It's the original plan. Abraham believed God. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Uh, the people of Israel, when they were scattered because of their disobedience, a child growing up in a foreign land because their parents rebelled against God, may feel hopeless. God says, or Moses told him, you turn to God with all your heart and love the Lord thy God and obey what you know. Right. And God will take it from there. That's principle of faith and grace. Uh, it's a matter of seeking God, not just walking in a you know ceremonial activity or perfectly obeying some uh, ceremony or law. It was the original plan. Verse 9. Here's the word of faith. As applied to these people in AD 58. Okay? If, if we were going back uh, under Moses' law before Christ came, the word of faith would be obey God through His laws and ceremonies with all your heart. Have His law in your heart. Do this with all your heart. Now, in AD 58, the word of faith, the justification by faith, is that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In the end. Okay? Romans 6.22 The end. Receiving the end of your faith. Uh is salvation, eternal life. So, the justification program in, the, in, in AD 58 is to be obeying Jesus, to the best of my knowledge, to be embracing God's law in this day through Jesus Christ with my whole heart, 
whether I know it all, whether I am perfectly capable, and so forth. God has established His church and program now for all nations to partake. As we said before, okay, Israel... That as a nation, they were the national caretakers of God's program. For every Gentile and all of Abraham's offspring that were not under Jacob, they had to come in through this, the caretaker, to get to the program. Now, in Jesus Christ, Israel, because they altered the program, they messed up the program, they uh, changed it from salvation by grace to salvation by who you are and, and your religious activities, they altered the program. God took it away from them and gave it to the remnant. Um, and now the church, made up of converted Jew and Gentile, now they are the caretakers of the program. And if you want the program, you've got to come in through the caretakers <coughs> still. But it's the church. It's, it's biblical church program that God is working through. Uh, it says here, Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto justification. That's now. When you believe with all your heart, you turn to the Lord with your heart, you confess Him, you believe in Jesus as your Lord and confess Him as such, you are justified before God now. And with the mouth, confession is continually made unto salvation. It separates justification from salvation. Salvation is at the end. Salvation is the ultimate. Justification is your present standing. You've got to maintain that justification all the way to the end. Okay? Um, verse 11. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Uh, that, is, that means a number of things. Not just that, well, if I believe on him, I'm not going to be ashamed to get baptized. It means that, but it means a lot more. If you look at Isaiah 28, 16, where he is quoting... It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he that believeth shall not make haste. We find in 1 Peter 2, 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And then here he says, shall not be ashamed. What's it saying? What's it saying is this. Whoever builds on this foundation, whoever follows this course, whoever trusts in this person, when they get to the end of the road, they will not be confounded right. and realize it was wrong. I took the wrong road. I, I, trusted on, I built on the wrong stone. I trusted the wrong path. And they get to the end, and then they have to make haste, which means they have to flee their position. Okay, it's almost as though you're talking about uh, standing on a position, but when it comes to court, you have to flee that position because you realize it's not going to stand. Okay, and so in the end, ultimately, you're not going to have to flee your position. You're not going to stand confounded, uh, approved wrong, and you're not going to be ashamed. Those all mean about the same thing because they're the same verse quoted different ways. All right? And what it means is, if I take this course, if I take this stand, when I get all the way to the end, I'm not going to suddenly realize that was a wrong decision. That's the point he's making. Whosoever believeth on him shall not in the end ultimately be ashamed. You will be so glad that you took that position, you will not be standing there realizing you took the wrong course. Verse 12. For there is no difference now in AD 58, okay? You, that couldn't be said before Cornelius. There was a difference. But the middle wall of partition has been torn down, and now in the salvation program, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Quoting Joel, all right? Uh, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that was a prophecy of the grafting into the Gentiles. Yes. That it, there's coming a day when Israel will no longer be the caretakers and you have to go through them. But whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord 
in this program will be saved. Um, in Genesis 4.26, And to Seth and to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah. Okay? Uh, that meant they began to worship the true God. That's what the word means. It doesn't mean come to the altar and pray the sinner's prayer. That may be the first step of calling upon the name of the Lord, but calling upon the name of the Lord is a term in the Scripture that means worshiping the true God. A relationship right. yeah. with the true God. Okay? In Joel 2.32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Uh, there it is, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is Jehovah. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. And unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, uh, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Then in 1 Peter 1, 17, it says, and if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now, this is all talking about the same relationship. So did Paul make a mistake? He's quoting Old Testament passages that refer to Jehovah, and he's applying them to Jesus Christ. Was that a misuse of Scripture? Absolutely not. We're not going to charge an apostle with misusing the Scripture. Uh, obviously, they could interchange them without any problem. Okay? And even Peter said, if you call on the Father, uh, so whosoever should call on the name of the Lord in, in Romans is kurios, talking about the Lord Jesus. All right? Now, I talked to a man in Columbia last week who is one of these fellows who make a big deal about uh, the word, the... the Tetragrammaton, which is YHWH, the, the name of God in Hebrew, and there's discrepancies on that, whether it should be YHWH or YHVH or JHVH or whatever. Anyways, we're not going to get into that. But uh, they're, they, they try to make it out to where the Jews replacing YW uh, or YHVH, replacing that with Jehovah, I mean Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, replacing Jehovah with Lord was wrong. They tried to say that that was, that was wrong and it was, shouldn't be done. And so they are making a big to-do about restoring the name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, whichever one. Uh, there's controversy there as well, which one it should be. So as I'm listening to this guy, he's explaining it all to me, the thought came to me that, what do the apostles do? Okay. Now, we know in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, then began men to call upon Jehovah. We know that it says in Joel, who serves to call upon the name of Jehovah. We know that Paul then translates that, or he, he writes it down, he quotes it, who serves to call upon the name of the Lord. And Peter says, on the Father, but if the apostles quoting the Old Testament used the word Lord, instead of Yahweh or Jehovah, then that proves to me that it's perfectly fine yep. mm -hmm. to, separate, to substitute uh, L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And the King James puts it in caps so you know it is Jehovah. Okay? You know it is the Tetragrammaton. Uh, and if it's not in all caps, then it's probably Adonai. If it's God, it's probably Elohim or something else like that. But when it's all caps, Lord, it's Jehovah. Every time you see it in the King James Old Testament. So for Paul to quote it and use kurios, Lord, instead of the tetragrammaton, YHVH, or the, the pronunciation Yahweh or Jehovah, tells me that this guy's uh, full of beans. Yep. That it was not a big issue. That it's not, it's not a violation of the commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, which they're making it as though it was a, you know, a violation of the command. If Paul did it, I can do it. If Paul did it, it's okay, yep. and we don't have to worry about it. Amen. So next time you meet one of those guys, uh, and, and what he tried to say when I brought that up to him, 
he tried to say, well, uh, uh, that all the New Testament writings were also in Hebrew. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> They're hidden in the Vatican. Like, no, that sounds like Alex Jones. Um, uh, no. Paul, the Apostle Paul, would not write to the church at Rome in Hebrew. Or to the Colossians. Or to the Corinthians. Or to the Galatians. He would not write to these Gentile churches in Hebrew. They all spoke Greek. Greek was the language spoken. He wrote in Greek. Right. And uh, so, anyways. It's good to be able to look at what the Apostles did and... Lay some of these things aside. Okay. Now, verse four, uh, 14 here in Romans. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? He's, he's going to walk us through the very practical means of grace. We don't see predestination or unconditional election here. We see God's practical way of calling men to salvation. How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Now, as you remember, God spoke from heaven to Israel, and they said, we cannot, we cannot handle this. You go talk to God, and then come and tell us what he said. And God said, they have well spoken. What I will do is use that very program from their own lips. I will raise up a prophet among them, among their, of their brethren, and I will speak to them through that person. Okay? And that's the way God planned to do it. So Paul is just saying, this is God's program, has been for a long time. The problem is, they did not obey their prophets. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? They ran on presumption. Instead of listening to what the prophets said and tuning in to God through his prophets, they ran on presumption. Verse 17, so then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay, that's God's means of justification. Uh, you hear the word of God through the preacher, you believe it, you call upon the Lord out of faith. It's very practical. Um, God's program was to deliver his word through preachers. Verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? He's working up to something here. Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now we're talking about God's witness. In Israel's hymn book, Psalm 19, it is speaking of the witness of God through His creation. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Paul is using that verse to show that Israel should have known God's ways because their own hymn book says that His ways were proclaimed throughout the whole earth by creation. Chapter, verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? Know what? No. They should have known God's means of operation. Right. They should have known it wasn't this. They should have known it wasn't this. They should have known that this was His program. Right. Okay? In the election of grace, finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, they should have known would be striving to obey God, not thinking that you, He owes you anything, and not just resting in religious activity or who you are, but striving to please and obey God. That's how Noah found grace. That's how Abraham found grace. Okay? They should have known that. Verse 19, Did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. In other words, Moses is letting them know that their position is not unconditional. It's not because of who they are. It's not because of their religious activities alone. Because when God was angry with them, He said, They have provoked me to anger with that which is no God. Let me read it to what He said in Deuteronomy 32. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Okay? They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. God is saying way back here through Moses, your position is not unconditional. You've got to walk by faith. Isn't that what he's saying? Yeah. Or I'm going to give your caretaker position uh -huh. to someone who is now not the people of God. Yeah. 
I'm going to give it to the Gentiles. Moses warned him of that. Yep. Okay? Now, verse 20, But Esaias is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Okay, we're talking about why Israel as a nation is not being saved. He said, My prayer to God is they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They're going about to establish their own means of justification. We're children of Abraham. You know, we're practicing the ceremonies of the law. God owes it to us. And Paul is showing through reason and principle that that was never the case. That was never the program. Justification by the religious activities of the law would require this because the blood That's of both right. goats can't take away sin and the law cannot offer life after trespass. Okay? So it's always been here where the, the choosing of grace, the electing of grace has been. He said, uh, <clears throat> Israel should have known God's way and they should have known that their position was conditioned upon God's mercy and grace. Now, if you look at chapter, chapter 10 there, verse 20. Verse 20 and verse 21 are Isaiah 65.1 uh, and Isaiah 65.2. Okay? In Isaiah 65.1 it says, I am sought of them that ask not after me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. Verse uh, Isaiah 65.2 I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. So, the Apostle uh, Paul says, Esaias is very bold and saith, I was found in them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me, but to Israel he saith, okay, he, he, he distinguishes that, to Israel he says, I have spread out my hands all day long unto a disobedient and gainsaying or back-talking people. A disobedient and back-talking people. Israel knew from Moses. They knew from the time of Isaiah. They should have known that their position was dependent upon staying in God's favor, finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. They were not sinlessly perfect, though they got the idea that they were not sinful because they were practicing the law. They, that one man that Jesus healed, they kicked him out and said, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? What is that saying? We didn't think, they didn't think they were. Um, so the caretakers redefine the program their way. The caretakers misrepresented God's salvation. They, they come to sea and land to make one proselyte, one disciple. And when they had made him, they made him twofold more the child of hell than themselves because he started doing this. So he, he was vaccinated against the truth. Because yep. when you don't teach the truth and you give people assurance, you actually vaccinate them against the truth. That's right. So... Their caretaker position was taken away and given to the remnant that did get it, who were truly converted, who did love God's program, and all believing Gentiles could then come into that without going through Judaism. Right. How could anyone get Calvinistic uh, teaching out of this? There's nothing here that is unconditional predestination. It's, it's not there. Nope. The only way they can get that is when they derail in chapter 9 and they fail to see the parallel. And they think Paul is talking about the same thing when he says, uh, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Okay? We learned last week Israel was the caretakers through Jacob. Okay, that eliminated, eliminated Ishmael, Esau, the sons of Keturah, and all their offspring. They were not the chosen caretakers, but the children of Jacob or Israel were. Alright? And they are not all Israel which are of Israel. That means they're not all converted that are a part of the caretaker nation. That, that we're talking about the distinction here and here. Then he says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Talking about the caretakers. That's talking about the distinction between this and this. Right. So there's a parallel. The Calvinist doesn't separate the two like he should. And so he thinks that the whole time we're talking about the distinction of this and this, and he blows it. 
basically. Uh, because then he runs down there to where the child, uh, not even being born yet, neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, and he thinks we're talking about this and this. Right. No, we're talking about this and this. And so you can't apply it there. You see that? Mm. It's not like it's, well, that's Brother Mark's interpretation. No, it's, it's, it's the only way it can be interpreted. Right. You can't interpret it any other way. All right, we're not going to get into chapter 11, but chapter 11, verse 1, just briefly. I say then, okay, this is the conclusion. It's too bad the chapter break is where it is. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Has God forsaken his promise to Abraham? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So what's he saying? Hath God cast away <coughs> true children of faith? No. He said, I'm one of these. All he's done is taken the caretaker position away from the nation and given it to those who truly were following him to begin with. 